So let's talk about stances and movement in Krav Maga. Now, a big part of Krav Maga is our self-defense, but we also have to really talk about the different elements of why we go to certain stances and our movement and where should we be moving towards and disengaging and how do we move with weapons? How do we move around when there's multiple attackers? So there's a lot that goes into it that sometimes can be overlooked because it's such a simple concept of a basic movement and then we move on from there. But you actually need to have this continue on um, and, and always practice from different stances and different movements. But what we're gonna start with first is what we call our passive or neutral stance. Now, this isn't necessarily a position that we're going to be teaching our students over and over again, but it's just a tool that we use to have them start certain drills or combatives. So what we want them to understand is just stand as if you're in your everyday life. That's the most important thing with this. You know, if we're in this kind of power A stance and we're doing a stress drill and we're waiting for an attack, that's not really realistic. I mean, sometimes we may stand like that, but majority of the time, you're either down looking at your phone texting or you're on the phone, you're holding something. So that's kind of how we want them to stand. So it's not always just waiting for them. They're just shifting their weight a little bit, things like that. So whenever we're talking about passive or neutral stance, that's what we really want our students to comprehend. That's what we want them to do, like I said, in, in certain drills or um, combatives or strikes or combinations that they're working on. Now the next stance that we're going to talk about is our guard stance. Our guard stance is kind of indicating that we don't necessarily want to fight, but we are getting ready. In law enforcement, they call it their interview stance. So what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be stepping back. Now, when we step back, I don't have to drastically get into a fighting stance and, and have the, the back fall of the foot up ready to go. This is just kind of, I feel uncomfortable. I'm gonna just step back a little bit to kind of get ready. And if things were to go down, I may do a quick adjustment step to really get to my stance and slightly bend the knees. But this is just, I don't know what's going on. I want to create a little bit of distance. So something that I like to tell people is <clears throat> someone that I'm comfortable with, I'm about an arm distance away. Somebody I'm not comfortable with, I'm about my arm reach and their arm reach. So someone I'm comfortable with about three feet, someone I'm uncomfortable with about six feet. That reactionary gap is huge. Now somebody that I'm not comfortable with is, is getting into my space, I may step back just to create a little bit more distance between me and them. Now law enforcement will typically step back with their firearm side to protect it and whatnot and then talk. But um, you know, if we're not carrying a weapon or anything, that's where we would step with, back with our dominant leg, whether that's right or left, whatever you feel strongest kicking with. And once again, remember, we're stepping back. And the next thing that I wanna talk about is what are we doing with our hands? So <clears throat> with this, we can, we can do a few different things. I'm not always gonna put my hands up and they're open because that, it's not really natural to talk to somebody. Because if I felt uncomfortable and I was not trying to necessarily alarm them and I did this, that may alarm them a little bit. But if I just kind of step back and I'm like, yeah, yeah, no, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, totally, yeah, no, I understand. And maybe create a little bit more space, but my hands are up and I'm starting to talk with them. Okay, so I can use my hands and talk. All right, so just here, moving them around. I can also just take that step back and I can just kind of place one hand on top of the other and, and I'm right here. I'm not necessarily going to interlock my fingers as I do this because sometimes you have that like Chinese finger trap thing where you're, you're getting caught on your knuckles. But just hand on hand and, or I could be like in a prayer position talking to them and every now and then or, or doing something fidgeting a little bit. But I'm getting my hands above my waist. I'm, I'm ready to go. Uh, crossing our arms is another option. But I'm not going to crisscross them to where I tuck them in or, or here. Just unfolding takes that little extra second. I'm just going to put one hand on top of the other. And I can talk from here, but I'm just tactically ready if, God forbid, something did happen where I, I felt uncomfortable, I trust that, and then all of a sudden something does, I can, I can block a lot faster. So here's another thing. We don't ever want to step back and have our hands in our pocket. That's just asking for trouble, you know, or even putting our thumbs here. Hands should always be above the waist, and, and those are just different things that you can do with your students. And hand on top of here, I'm kind of making an L, whatever you want with your arms, but that's very, very important, hands above the waist. So just make sure that, like I said, we're, we're getting back to a somewhat comfortable stance, uh, so that way I can have my weight distributed equally, forward, back, left, right. Like I said, it's not 
100% ready to go yet. I don't, I'm not going to bend the knees and fall on the foot. That's more of our fighting stance, which we're about to get into now. All right, so let's discuss our fighting stance. So this is no longer where we're talking about a threat. This is where we're ready to go. We're ready to engage. If I go into a fighting stance, I'm going to be hitting something. I'm going to be kicking something. It's kind of like if you draw your weapon, you're ready to shoot and kill. Like that is your mentality, and that's what they teach you. Um, from here, if I'm stepping and I'm clenching my fist, like I'm, I'm ready to go. I'm now becoming a, the aggressor. So the difference between guard and fighting stance is instead of now stepping back, I'm now going to be stepping forward because I want my mentality to be, I'm going forward, I'm the aggressor, I'm going to win this fight, I'm advancing. In the guard stance, remember, that wasn't a fighting situation. That was just to where we felt uncomfortable and wanted to create a little bit of space just in case something happens. This is something's already happened or it's, a, like it's about to go down and I'm making the preemptive strike. So we're going to have our, our feet a little bit more than shoulder width apart. So I'll go this way as well. A little bit more than shoulder width apart. I'm going to step forward as if I'm doing a normal step to where I feel comfortable. I'm not doing a big step. Just a small little step out in front. Now, if you notice, all 10 toes are going to be pointed forward. I'm going to have my back heel slightly up. The reason for that is I'm now shifting my weight forward. Okay, I'm ready to explode. I'm going to be faster. On, I'm going to be faster on the balls of my feet than I will be on my heels. If I'm on my heels, and then I do it just a little bit slower. So we take that step forward. That back heel slightly comes up. Our knees are going to be bent, just ready to be able to move around, be a little bit faster. Okay, our hips are squared up to the target. My shoulders are going to be squared up to the target. My elbows are going to be in near my ribs, and my hands are going to be about 8 to 10 inches out. Now, the next thing that I want to do from here is I could fight with open hands, but if I'm going to make a fist, I want to start with my pinky, then my ring, middle, and pointer. So what that does is I'm taking the smallest finger that's going to be rolled in, and then I'm tucking that in first. Whereas if I just close my hand, my middle finger, my pointer finger might catch first and there'll be a little bit of space down here. So we're folding in, making a nice tight fist. All right, and our hands are up. I'm not gonna be really tense with my shoulders. I wanna relax them because when I'm, I'm relaxed, I'm fast. And I wanna tuck my chin, that way I'm protecting it. And my hands, like I said, are extended and I'm out, I'm ready to go. So one more time. The reason we're doing this again, I'm stepping forward. I become the aggressor. That back heel is up, ready to go. The knees are bent. I can move around fast. My hips are squared to the target. That way I can throw all of my weapons. Shoulders, same thing. That way I get good rotation. That chin is tucked to protect our, our lower bottom of our face and kind of hiding it behind our hands. Hands are eye level so that way we can de defend our face so the elbows are in, defending our body as well. So that is going to be our fighting stance uh, in Krav Maga. So a couple frequently asked questions that we'll get either for our guard stance or fighting stance. The first one with our guard stance that uh, some beginner students may have a hard time with this is, I feel off balance, what's going on, how can I, how can I improve that? So a lot of times when we talk about our, shoulder, or our feet being a little bit more than shoulder width apart, somebody steps back like so. Okay, so they're actually stepping back at an angle instead of just sliding their foot back. So that can be an important thing to, to just correct. Because we, we need to think about a square, okay? From here, I have one foot in the bottom and one foot in the top of the square. Okay, the other two angles are obviously blank for right now because I don't have four legs, I only have two. But if somebody was to push me forward, my front leg can catch me. Somebody pushes back, my back leg can catch me. So when your student blades their stance and they step back like this and they're kind of almost on one line, that doesn't necessarily look like a square anymore. All right, <clears throat> so now I have balance going forward and back, but I don't have the balance left and right. So majority of the time, that which is causing that issue, is just by the way that they're stepping back. Okay, now if they turn their body, um, you know, that's great, but that kind of leads into the next um, question of why do we want to square our hips? So, you know, why not just stand this way? Well, here's the issue. If my threat is right here, and I blade my body and step back, okay, I'm not really in proper body alignment to throw a punch. So my, my jab, my left side of my body is already fully rotated. So when I go to throw with this right one, yes, I get to rotate a lot, but look how far it's coming away. 
It's going to have to go across my body now. But when I'm squared up to my target, all of my limbs are pretty much equal and I'm ready to go. Even if I am in my guard stance and I'm here, and if, God forbid, I have to attack, okay, I'm able to attack. So it's a lot faster to throw any of my limbs, be able to rotate and get maximum power. So that's something that we do want to stress to them just in case they come from a different background and they're asking about that. You can also talk about how if they do go to like a guard stance like this, that this leg is completely exposed. Um, they can get that swept and, and different things like that. So it's harder to defend against takedowns or anything. So definitely important to know the different stances in martial arts to kind of take a background uh, or take uh, or look at the background of them and why they do them and, and kind of figure that out so that way just you can have more knowledge of why they're in certain positions or what they did or kind of what's the stance for different popular styles so definitely just continuing your education is an important thing too. So a common question for our fighting stance is if I'm really strong left-handed but I feel comfortable kicking with my right leg, what type of stance should I be in? So we do have an orthodox stance, which is typically where you step back with the right leg, and southpaw is where you're stepping back with your left leg. The reason for that is whenever you step back with the left, that left hand is now gonna travel a little bit further. I'm gonna push off further away from my target, so I'm gonna generate more power. Uh, but one thing that I like to tell students is, all right, that's great, you can be really strong left-handed, but if you were to kick, which leg would you kick me with? Majority of the time, it will be the right leg for people. Well, in Krav, a groin kick uh, is not an end-all, be-all type move, but it's a very, very effective move. Or a right knee strike to the groin, very effective. So having that power leg back is a, um, a big deal too. So really kind of seeing where they feel comfortable um, with, with the kicks is something that I always look forward or I always look for in my students and, and kind of seeing where they're at and, and what they like. So when you do come across that question, if they're like left-hand dominant and they have a boxing background and that's where they're comfortable, then let it be. Okay, then they'll just keep practicing and learn how to use that left leg a little bit more. But typically, our legs are stronger than our hands, so that's why we'll tell them, put your power leg back, even if you are southpaw. Well, now, if you're left-hand dominant, you're going to have great jabs and you're going to eventually learn how to have a really good cross and both your hands are going to be not equally as strong, but very, very close because of that. So it could definitely go hand in hand, but something to think about with them. Another question that, that comes up a lot is, if we step forward, aren't we getting closer to the target? I thought we always talk about creating space and being aware of our surroundings and you know, trying to avoid the situation, but that is true. But once again, our fighting stance is, I'm ready to fight. I'm, I'm gonna fight. So it, it's one of those things to where when you commit to your fighting stance, and we need to stress that to our students, you are ready to go, like you're fighting. And um, the reason we're stepping forward is because I'm getting that weight to move in with the punch. Or I'm coming in, I'm getting my weight going forward to throw maybe like a preemptive kick or something. So it's just a lot better to go forward, show that you're aggressor, and then just keep moving forward, keep moving forward, keep moving forward. So that's something that, um, you know, sometimes they'll ask, but uh, if they do, that's one of the, the best things for them to just get. Whenever we defend ourselves or we're about to fight, we fight with everything we got and we keep moving forward. So now we're going to discuss five different drill types for you guys, whether it's a guard stance or fighting stance. These can just kind of be mixed and mingled. So remember our five different types. We have fatigue or fitness drills. We have stress drills. We have awareness. We have movement. And we have aggression drills. So we're going to get started with the fitness one. Now you can pick and choose uh, any exercise. I'm just going to choose jumping jacks. He's going to stay where he's at. He's going to be doing jumping jacks go. Now, I'm going to be anywhere in the room, so if you have lots of people, you can just walk around one or two, sometimes go behind them or the side. As soon as I say, hey, he's going to pop into a guard stance, just turning and facing me. Maybe he gets startled. Now, if he gets startled out in public, of course, you're not going to go to a, a fighting stance, but you may just go to a guard stance. Hey! All right, he's going to practice different ones. He goes back to jumping jacks and move around. Hey! I am just looking at the class, making sure that they're at least stepping back. Hey! All right, he's doing different things with his arms and hands and time. These exercises could be anything that you want, so you can definitely mix and match all of these ones we're going to talk about. For stress drill, what's going to happen is he's going to have his eyes closed. Now, the only purpose of having a student close their eyes is just to really get them completely unaware. All right, now, of course, in our everyday life, we shouldn't be walking around with our eyes closed. That would just be foolish. 
So, you know, at least talk about this. A good thing that I like to say to students is for the sake of the drill, we're just going to be closing our eyes. Uh, closing your eyes and not knowing what's going on definitely builds stress too. Now, if you turn the lights off and then close, close your eyes, it gets even darker. But what's going to happen is I'm either going to bump him from the front or from the back. Now, make sure that your students, obviously, you know, you address to them pushing on the shoulders from the back or from the front. You know, we don't want anything inappropriate happening or you know, feel, anyone feeling uncomfortable being touched. So make sure you just be talking about, hey, guys, you're going to come around, bump the partner on the shoulders from the front or back. This is like you're out in your, and this is a way of pre-framing it, you're out in your everyday life, somebody accidentally bumps into you. You know, it could have been, hey, I'm so sorry about that. He doesn't necessarily have to get into a fighting stance because he got bumped, but he's getting into a guard stance. He's just, hey, oh, okay, hey, sorry about that, no problem, you know. So this is just training them to recognize the level of threat. And it's not always going to be someone that's trying to kill you that bumps into you. Understand that. All right, so we don't have to train necessarily for that, but we'll do another drill to where you do. So his eyes are closed. He just kind of gets to a guard stance. Then he closes his eyes again, moving around. All right, and he can just practice different things with his hands. So the next one that we're going to talk about is an awareness drill. He's going to be either in his guard stance or fighting stance, just kind of shuffling around. Now, what's going to happen is I'm going to walk around with different numbers that I'm holding up on my hands. Just kind of maybe I'm walking diagonal across the floor, or maybe I'll hold a different object. I could just kind of mix it up. But while they're moving around, and this is something you could do in a warm-up, so everyone starts shuffling around, go. And I won't even say anything. I'll just walk by with the number or I'll grab an object, and I'll be like, time, all right, what number did I walk by with? Two. Ah, oh, it was three. Ah, oh, good try, good guess. All right, maybe I'll grab a pen, or maybe I'll make it very eye-opening for people, and I'll get a knife, and I'll walk by with a knife and see if anybody catches it. So you could definitely talk about how, when we're in our everyday life, if we're not looking for things or trying to be aware, we're going to miss them. And even in here, it's like you're just going through the routine. Okay, I know how my stance, I know how to move. They're practicing it, but you just do that little twist of a random object or number or something, and it definitely kind of hits home to be more aware. Our next one is going to be a movement drill. So once again, he's going to be in his fighting stance or guard stance, moving around, kind of shuffling. But we're just going to throw objects in the way. So it gives him different things to move around. So he's moving around. This could be so many different uh, scenarios and situations. You guys can use your, your creativity for it. But just having to maintain a stance. Every now and then I can switch and be like, all right, guard stance. Fighting stance. And time. So you just call out different things, get creative with it. And for our last one, we're going to talk about an aggression drill. So. This is going to just require a, a pad that your partner can strike. We're just going to do palm strikes for now. But he's going to be in his neutral stance. I can either tap him from the front or back. Once I do that, he's going to get into either stance and he's going to go to town because now this is a threat. And this is a drill that you want to build off to talk about the different levels of threats. And there's little tweaks that I can do. So I can hit him here and maybe not have the pad up. or. I hit him here and the pad is there, he goes to town because this recognizes as a threat. So, you know, it, this is where tying drills together comes into play and, and making you a, a lot more better as an instructor of just that hidden repetition. So maybe that drill we talked about earlier where you get bumped, just go to your stance, then you do the aggression drill of where they get hit and then it just either one. All right, so we'll do this a couple times. Once again, Tell your students to be respectful, not to like hit in the face or, or do stuff. Now, if that's the, the class that you're going for and it's maybe more advanced, then maybe I will pop them a little bit in the face. But, it, you know, beginners, be respectful. And then they throw their palm strikes. Now, he could just throw a flurry anywhere from 2 to 10. You could tell your students to hit 20 times. You could have them keep hitting until you say time. So it's really all on you as the instructor of what you want your goal for as far as them hitting. Hit him from the side every now and then. All right, and time. So lots of different ways to time these or give them numbers or goals or fatigue and, and just mixing them all up. But those are a few different examples 
of our basic stances and to some drills.